on One Plus One, have you ever forgotten the movie but remembered the music? Celebrated composer Michael Nyman explains why and how Get Up makes Australia's politicians sit up and listen. Hello, I'm Jane Hutchin. Welcome to One Plus One. There's no doubting the effect digital media and the internet has had in shaping our lives, changing the way we communicate and now even changing the way we do politics. Inspired by the use of online fundraising during the US presidential race, two young Australians back in 2005 set up an internet advocacy organisation called GetUp. In a little over five years, with close to half a million members, it's grown into a political force with persuasive power. GetUp's national director is 25-year-old Simon Sheik, a young man in demand. He's regularly courted by MPs, CEOs and the Prime Minister herself. Simon Sheik is talking with Virginia Hausiger in Canberra. Simon Sheik, welcome to One Plus One. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you. Get Up is described in all sorts of ways as a um, grassroots advocacy organisation. What is Get Up to you? Uh, well, to me, really, it's a group of 450,000 Australians who have a set of values that they want to see politicians and corporate leaders enact. Values like social justice, uh, like environmental sustainability and economic fairness. Uh, it's nothing more than a mouthpiece, a service, if you like, for these people to use uh, to enact their values. 440-odd thousand members is huge. It's bigger than, <laughs> bigger than political parties. All of them combined. So why do you think it works? We've seen political parties decline in membership numbers uh, over an extraordinary period of time, probably the last 30 years uh, of decline for the major parties in this country. And you've got to ask yourself why that's the case. Political parties are increasingly elite. They're increasingly about the party itself, as opposed to uh, being about the value set that people have. Uh, Get Up members traditionally want to take action on a particular issue. If they don't like whatever we send them as an action for them to take, they'll ignore that and take action on the next. And it's that issue-based model that I think works particularly well for the average Get Up member. I must just ask you uh, about your donations, where the source of your money comes from and independence. Of course, the independence of Get Up has been questioned a number of times. You've had very big donations from unions, well over a million dollars. Um, how can you continue to claim to be independent? Well, the beauty of the Get Up model is that it actually relies uh, on those small dollar donations. About 80% of the funding, and that includes the startup funding, which of course has to come from major contributors, 80% of that overall funding comes from small dollar donations. These are, these are donations of less than $50. In the last 12 months alone, more than 40,000 Australians have contributed to this movement. Now, what? One of those organisations, now most of those are people, one of those organisations was a union, uh, the large one that mm. I'm talking about, the over $1 million that you talk about uh, CFMEU, came from the yeah. CFMEU, a union in this country. Now, they donated to an advertising campaign that Get Up members started. They had absolutely no say in the advertising campaign. But that, that is a huge, huge donation absolutely. from any organisation. So do they get bang for their buck from you? Well, I think they do if they care about a progressive Australia. If they care about where this country is going, if they believe in social justice, in economic fairness, environmental sustainability, then I believe Get Up members get extraordinary value. Now, on the question of independence, which you, which you also raise, I mean, if we look at uh, the last uh, couple of years, for example, just the last, since the 2007 election, over 20 of Get Up campaigns uh, have targeted the government of the day, that's the Australian Labor Party, the government of the day, uh, and only a handful, less than three, have targeted the coalition. Why is that? Because we're interested in changing decisions and governments make decisions. You, um, you're 25? That's right. You uh, joined the organisation to be the national director three years ago, yeah. so 22. Um, it's very young to take on a role like this for an organisation that's been this, this powerful and influential. How did you know at 22 that you had it in you to take on an organisation like this? I'm not sure you ever can know. Uh, I'm not sure you ever can fully know uh, what you're capable of as a human being. Something my father always 
uh, instructed into me closely and always mentioned uh, was that, uh, and I know it sounds a little corny, but you know, you can do anything. Uh, but when he kept pushing me all the way along the lines, it was particularly my father that pushed me in academic directions in particular through high school, uh, there was constantly my uh, my opinion of that's too far, that's too far a jump, surely I won't make that. But in seeing uh, success, I think one can then learn at what you're capable of and what you're not capable of. And so when I was, when I was given the opportunity to take on this role, uh, it was in the context of a very rigorous process, in the context of uh, a group of board members who did feel a level of confidence. Uh, I'm sure that they weren't 100% certain either. I, I can assure you I certainly wasn't. Uh, but over the years, it's get up members who have driven the campaigns. I mean, it's the stories of these members, it's their ideas, it's their emails about not only campaigns, but even about specific tactics, uh, specific scripts for TV ads, all of that. I mean, all we do is capture those great ideas and magnify them. And that's what makes the job uh, a little easier. You've got a really interesting background. You came from a pretty tough sort of background. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, I think many of us can point to moments in our life that were particularly tough, so I'm not sure that my story is any tougher than most. Uh, but as I was uh, growing up, uh, I grew up with a mother who had a chronic mental illness uh, that really became more severe having lost my sister. She was uh, lost before I was born. Uh, and over those years, I guess I got to learn a lot of what it was like to be the primary carer. My father had so a you, heart attack. So you became the primary carer of your mum my, as, as a young kid? Yeah, about 10 or 11 years old, uh, my father had a heart attack, which meant that really he wasn't able to be around, uh, quite a severe heart attack. He wasn't able to be around uh, to play that caring role. So at the age of 10 or 11, to be the prime carer of a mother with mental health uh, illness problems is, is an enormous um, task. You don't know that at the time, though. At the time, uh, you dealt the cards that uh, that you've got, uh, you, whatever that analogy is, uh, and and you you do try and do your best. I mean, there are... but at the time, you were also going to a, a school that was officially um, uh, considered a school for underprivileged kids. So you know, you you had it tough on all on all fronts. You know, I think those moments of being able to uh, reflect on uh, the age of nine or ten, uh, my moments of thinking, gee. Uh, I would love to have a mother and a father, a family like other people do. Uh, I got to look around in my school and actually say, you know what, it's not all that bad. There were so many people uh, in extreme poverty in this country, uh, in that area, uh, in this part of Sydney that I grew up in. And so it was seeing that relative poverty that actually made me realise just how lucky I was to be able to be in a family uh, where at the very least there weren't alcohol issues, uh, there weren't problem gambling issues, there was enough money, uh, even though it was welfare, government welfare, there was enough to be spent on education, which is exactly what we prioritised. But well, how then did you get from that situation where you could have just disappeared into, you know, a wasted childhood and, and unemployment, how did you get from there? to, as you did, doing an economics degree, ending up uh, as an economist working in Treasury and now the head of this very powerful organisation? I think in reflecting on that, there are a couple of moments, I guess, and a couple of people who played a big role in that. Uh, first of all, it was very difficult around the age of 10, 11, when my father had that heart attack. There were certainly a couple of years there where I wasn't on the right path, certainly a couple of years there where the people that I began uh, hanging out with, the people I was friends with, uh, were not uh, the right type of people, and many of those uh, uh, are now uh, have either passed away or uh, are in jail. I mean, the, the community that around that area where I grew up was not a healthy one. Uh, but my father was able to play quite a significant role in the years that followed that, that sort of 13 to 16 year old uh, uh, part of my life, when my father was quite uh, influential in pushing me in the right direction. But really, in high school, uh, around the age of 16, was when I started to make a shift, a shift from someone who was going to a selective high school in Sydney, uh, not exactly interested in every bit of academic life, I had no interest in politics, for example, at that point. Uh, but I saw a speech from Justice Kirby, and he told the story about how he was embarrassed uh, as a High Court Justice now, but at the time in his high school, he was embarrassed uh, about being gay. He was embarrassed about communicating that. And as he was telling that story, I got to see, I guess, some parallels between my own embarrassment about my own family situation. And then when I saw Senator Bill Heffernan uh, uh, do those despicable things to Justice Kirby, making allegations using parliamentary privilege, uh, I had a moment of realisation that 
we had to say something in return, that we couldn't allow someone to make these allegations of a fine human being in the way that he did. And so my teacher encouraged me to write a letter to the editor, as simple as that was. And I did that at the age of 16. And it was the first bit of activism, I guess, that I ever got involved with. And from there, seeing that published, seeing Justice Kirby come back to the school, delivering a speech with him, uh, just got me, I guess, a taste uh, of a different path. And from there, really, there was, uh, there was no stopping things. Simon, just lastly, at age 25, what next for you? Where do you see yourself in 10 years' time? The thing that drives me, I imagine in 10 years' time, I'll still be doing some form of what I'm doing now uh, because it is just such an intriguing place to work. When we look around the world, progressive activists, progressive campaigners are doing so much more to influence public policy outcomes and in particular to influence the decisions of corporates. So I'm absolutely intrigued about this space uh, and I can't see myself leaving this kind of space anytime soon. Well it will be fascinating to watch. Simon Sheikh, thank you very much for joining us. At Good to be with one. you.